This gospel reading is a powerful one and, and very evocative, especially for people who have experience on boats during storms. Uh, many people in this church have told me that they experience God profoundly on the water, sometimes because it's peace and serenity, sometimes the beauty, and sometimes the terror. This passage is primarily about fear. And there are a couple of kinds of fear that are going on. There's the fear of the storm itself, and that's what we tend to focus on. The disciples were afraid that the boat would capsize and they would drown. It was nighttime, and they probably couldn't see very much. All they knew was that they were in trouble. And the one person who they had seen accomplish miracles, the one person who could help them, was asleep. It was this immediate fear for their safety that led them to call out to Jesus and say, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? That was a real fear, the kind of fear that you feel in your stomach. It's the kind of fear most of us are comfortable talking about. Of course, we would call out to God if we were in a sinking boat. But there was another kind of fear going on in this story. They were afraid of the other side. They weren't just taking a leisurely boat trip. They weren't just out fishing for a couple hours only to return to familiar shores. They were going to an unknown territory. They were leaving Galilee, their home, and heading to Gerizines. Now most of them probably had never been to this place, nor did they have any desire to go there. The people over there were not believers in the one true God. They were Gentiles. And in biblical times, Gentiles were not well loved by the Jews. They were the other. You would not eat with them. You would not talk to them. And you definitely wouldn't go to their homes and minister to them. So the underlying fear was not what would happen if the boat sank, but what would happen if they made it to the other side. They knew how to ask Jesus for help in a sinking boat, but they weren't sure how to ask for help when it came to their discomfort and disdain for an entire group of people. And when Jesus ended the storm with the words, Peace, be still, they knew that this man was no mere mortal. This man had the power over the wind and the sea. They knew that he was more than anything they could have ever believed in before. Our nation is reeling over the murder of nine individuals at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston. And it is so hard to say what to know in the midst of something so horrifying. All week I've been thinking about this text from Mark and the fear in this text. And it occurred to me how connected hate and fear are. There's an underlying climate of fear in our world and our culture. And that fear leads us to separate from others. It leads, gives us an excuse not to know people who are different from us. And sometimes that separation makes it easy to hate. This fear is not a new thing. It was around in Jesus' time as well, and he did everything he could to combat it. Jesus was trying to bring people together. This crossing of the water wasn't just a physical crossing. It was an emotional and spiritual crossing as well. He was telling his disciples that he would not let anything separate him from the people of God, the children of God, and that God's love was not limited to any group of people. It was open to all. Jesus was determined to cross that divide no matter who or what tried to stop him. 
Water could not stop him. Slorm, storms would not slow him down. The questions and fears of the people around him would not steer him off his path. He was unwilling to back down. It was the love that he had for everyone, the commitment to all people that caused people to fear him and even hate him. And in the end, it was that fear and that hate that killed him. Yet what the people who killed him did not know was that not only could water not stop him, not only could people not stop him, not only could fear not stop him, but death itself would not stop him from accomplishing his mission of sharing the love of Christ, the love of God, with all people on the earth. Now sometimes we are inclined to domesticate Jesus. We talk about his love and kindness, and he was all of those things. But he was also powerful and strong. He was not to be trifled with. And when his disciples woke him up, he didn't say, hey, it's going to be okay. He woke up and he rebuked the wind. He said, peace, be still. He then turned to his disciples and said, why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? He refused to let people keep him from his mission, from sharing the word of God with all people. So he rebuked the wind and he demanded peace. He reminded his disciples that there was no room in that boat for fear, not as long as he was in the boat with them. Just recently, the families of those who were killed were given permission to address the shooter during his bond hearing. And while they expressed their grief and their anger, they also spoke words of mercy and forgiveness. They asked that he repent and give his life to Christ. It's incredible. And all of those words were moving, but what touched me the most were the words, hate won't win. We have no room for hate. The gospel passage from today is often referred to as Jesus calming the storm, but I think that's a misnomer. This was not Jesus calming a storm, it was Jesus conquering a storm. There were no calm in the words, peace be still. These were words of action, words of power. They call us, the people of God, to action as well. We are called to stop fearing the other and to cross the waters of hatred and divide. We have no room for hate in our world and definitely not our church. There is not even room in an enormous body of water for hate. The Apostle Paul was someone who knew what it was to overcome hate. He had been a persecutor of the Christians. But Jesus came to him and said, why do you persecute me? And that changed Paul. And it changed him so much that he crossed the divide and he became a Christian. So today, we read his letters, and we read from Corinthians today. And it ended with, we have spoken frankly to you, Corinthians. Our heart is wide open to you. There is no restriction in our affections, but only in yours. In return, open wide your hearts also. God is asking us to open wide our hearts, and that is scary because our hearts can be fragile. Hearing the words of the families who lost their loved ones is heartbreaking. But sometimes we have to let our hearts break a little to let love in and to release fear. People occasionally ask me how I still have faith in a world like this, where there is so much hatred and violence. And I don't always have a good answer. There are times when I just can't think about it all. I can't think of the big picture. I just focus on the things that are manageable. 
the people who can be helped. Yet sometimes I think we need to allow ourselves to be overwhelmed by the anguish of it all. The African Methodist Episcopal Church was formed in the end of the 18th century so that the African Americans could worship in relative freedom. Yet the sin of racism is still alive and even today they cannot worship in freedom. And that is tragic. We need to weep for what is happening in our world. Feel the weight of other people's pain. We need to get in the boat, even if we are afraid it will sink. And I'm not sure that sounds very hopeful, but there is hope. Because as long as we get in the boat, we will find that Jesus is there with us. And when Jesus is in the boat with us, there is never room for hate. And love will always conquer hate. Amen.